So we're going to start with the T, and what I'm going to do, I'm sorry for turning up all this triangle, and it's the only way I can find a T within a triangle. I want to triangulate how we got to the T, and, and I'm not going to go into a lot of literature things here. That we've got a mountain monograph on the T coming out, which will have all this in it. But there's been several approaches to the T that are relevant for today and help us explain why uh, the the T is at least a topic for discussion. Probably the most prevalent way we've, we've approached it, and it's certainly the way I've been engaged since the early 90s, is through skills and competencies, and the whole debate about what, what employability skills and what young people need or any worker needs to survive in the workplace. And this is also the origins in the early 90s of the, the actual work concept, the T concept that developed in the UK, when they were looking at the transformation of the economy, and it was an, you know, somebody said, we just need T-type people now. That the, the kind of people we're preparing aren't going to have the breadth and depth to manage the economy. And it kind of just laid their bow, then it was picked up in uh, Silicon Valley, and video, IDEO Design, and, and some others. But most of the last 20 years, it has still has skills come to whether I did it, or Fred Evers in Canada did it, uh, or the most recent attempts, uh, replications of what was done by the AACU are all valid, uh, and they pointed to the the heavy shift, or significant and rapid shift to a whole set of different kinds of skills and competencies beyond the content knowledge and the degree to, for anybody to survive in the workplace or in a career path and sustain their career. Okay, I'm going to leave that. Come back to that in a minute. On the other side, there were some other people that weren't always heard that said, oh, this is bigger than just skills competencies. We need a whole new mindset. We need a whole new professional. And out of this literature, in the late 90s, it was Jones and Philippi that wrote a book, uh, article about the fact that he was in film that laid out um, using a Rudyard Kipling cup with I said that there were six things that people had to know. Three of them were from, they had to blend knowledge of industry with knowledge of self. So you had to know uh, things like how, when, where, who, what, and why. Uh, and some of those were um, self development, why you're doing what you're doing, what's your purpose, how do I build on that, who do I know, and what do I know. And then on the knowledge, on the industry side, you had to know what changes were going on in the industry. Uh, where the where the opportunities were and where the niches were that you're going to have to move in, and they use the film industry as a project-based way you can build your reputation and move on. Coming in through the popular uh, work with Daniel Pink, uh, some of you heard is uh, Free Agent Nation, which is now uh, finally arrived after 25 years, and but he did talk about the whole. Uh, a whole new mind and talk, and he developed his own vocabulary, which hasn't resonated so much that every writer has to develop their own vocabulary, so he did that. Uh, and then we can jump to just a more recent work by Dan McGrill, who's at MIT and does robotics. And he went back to say, as robotics become more involved in, in our life and they take over jobs and tasks, then we have to have a whole different kind of person. And he went back down to the where web. Why and who? I will share a quote from him later on to show you how much how profound this is when I get to the robotics part of this. But he was talking today because of the rapid change in our AI and cognitive software and things that we need a whole different person. And yet, and then there was another stream of, of writing that came up from Robert Keegan out of Harvard. Uh, the book in over our heads. Some of you may have been aware of that. He was talking about the rapid cognitive development in every facet of our lives, and he said most of us coming through the education system, even higher ed, except at the most highest levels, were not prepared cognitively and, and deep learning uh, to handle the situation, whether it was at work, in the family, in the community, in, in, in every aspect of our daily lives. So they were talking about a whole different way to look at the person. It's not just adding a couple skills here. And so, when I'm at this point, after 30 years of doing this, I kind of stepped back and looked at all the skill work and said, yes, we've really been talking about a whole different person. And I kind of re-examined how my, all my research was together, and I can see emerging that, the need for a whole different person. 
But a lot of us are dealing with the intrepid neural the embedding type. And there's a whole literature there that is, is, is merging into this um, work, work by the Kauffman Foundation and others that look at the, the kind of attributes you need in intrapreneurial, um, the intrapreneurial. A lot of the skills and competencies overlap. But the article that I want to point to is one that Herbert Simon wrote, uh, was participating in just before he died. Uh, and he's looking at intrapreneurial individuals in AI. And with his graduate student at the time, his conclusion was that to be an entrepreneur today, you needed three things. You needed to three, answer three questions. What do I know? Who do I know? And do I know who I am? Okay? And you are going to see that from whatever way I can come from uh, on this triangulation, we all come to the T. Now, I'm going to start right now saying we got to be careful that we just, when we jump on this, uh, we've got some issues in here and some challenges. Uh, it's going to be, a lot of people say, and I do talk with industry on this, there's some people that say everybody can be a team. And then I'm looking at my really close friend and I said, yes, but your son is autistic. I function as autistic in math and engineering, but he's autistic. And you know he doesn't have very good social skills. And it's hard for them in team environments. They're hard for them when you're really on, on red skills that require a high functional interaction with other people. So there are people that we're going to have that aren't going to be moving to a team. So what are we going to do with them? And there's some scary research coming out of South Korea and Germany about young kids that spend all their time on devices and their brains aren't developing equally. And the brain that deals with the T stuff, the threat stuff, empathy, and collegial collaboration are slow to develop for it, developing all, which presents all other kinds of problems. So this is a, not a panacea that's going to fit everybody, but it's a way for us to look at how we can approach education in a way uh, more intentionally uh, to develop young people. So what I'm going to do today is just to emphasize, again, why employers are doing it. They find that people that have very deep specializations and experiences can't talk to other people. So when they go in engineers, computer science, that's all their experience has been around, no matter how good they, and they get attached into problems <coughs> that divide, require them to work with others. They, they are, they're failing uh, to be able to perform. So the song, you're gonna see this over and over again, to solve complex challenges and, and the problems we face require people from different disciplines to communicate with each other and they can pool their, their expertise. And so you're going to see this uh, several ways played out. So I'm going to start with the team. I should have braced this need because well, I'm going to come back to me. But we're going to talk about, and I'm going to break down and talk about the components. So the depth parts are deep in the disciplinary knowledge of one discipline. I'm going to change this around a bit because we really don't have literature about depth and knowledge and the discipline. It's really deep learning that we're talking about. And because if you're going to get analytical thinking, problem solving, you're very high in between taxonomy and systems. So the first part of it, and then, the, then there's the connection to other disciplines. So I'm going to build to the T, and the, this is a big T, and how we connect to other disciplines that we have to talk to. And eventually, at some point, uh, begin to connect to other systems. And then uh, the top part is our ability to balance the functional uh, boundaries as well as organizational boundaries, cultural boundaries, national boundaries, you name the boundary, we're going to have to be able to have the competencies to do that. So this is a full blown team with the mean of The mean is going to be the most critical important uh, at the undergraduate level. I mean, all the other pieces are here, but the most critical place we have to start is with the mean. So let me go through and build these components. The first is depth, and we studied this in my, and what we're really talking about when I get employers talk, it is depth of deep learning. Being able on the Bloom's taxonomy to get past just remembering facts, being able to understand basic relationships, and applying knowledge to certain contexts, but to really get deep into analyzing, evaluating, creating information. Now, if you read Keegan's work, he'll argue that undergraduate BAs get to about somewhere between applying and analyzing. Masters get into analyzing, we leave the high stuff to the 
PhDs. Ambassador Magola, if you've read her work on learning and knowing, saying that most of this Bloom stuff, the high-end Bloom stuff, comes after bachelor's degrees already graduate. And they come back and they have their aha moments afterwards of what they were doing. Now, most of us on the faculty side, myself included, said, well, I do that all the time. We do it in our mindset in the way we do things. It's not necessarily what students see us do. But Bloom's, but what they're asking for is a much deeper, deeper understanding. And when you do that, you have to have learning activities in contexts where they can develop those skills and, and those higher learning thinking skills. Okay, then we get into symptom thinking, which is really all about. You go to Peter Senge, because uh, he gives a general overview of systems. And it's understanding that problems are complex, they have many, many facets, and by just addressing one facet of the problem, um, and through one discipline, you miss all the connections. So to give us the leverage we need, and the insights we need, we need multiple people together. So he will argue in, in, his, in his work on systems that we now have to move from individualized knowledge to collaborative knowledge and collaborative work. So this is the same thing. So there's, this is the depth part. Now, the problem with systems is that every discipline represented in this room thinks of the system a different way. So when I go to IBM and say, what do you mean by a system? They say, well, just take all those definitions. Because what they've done, based on the problems they deal with, is define systems that they engage in our daily lives. So these are the systems that IBM will talk about. They'll talk about systems of flow. So it's our transportation and supply chain. It's our food system. It's our water. It's our energy. And for them, of course, and now the dominant one is the cloud. And then we got people's we got ones that interact with people, and it goes from construction, education, health, and banking, finance, etc. And then they have government at three different levels of government because they have different functions. Now, I will say that you know this is not this works. We've overlaid this with the, the grand challenges that were laid out for the 21st century for grand grand colleges, and it almost matches up. The names are kind of different, but it matches up. We match it to our research functions at University of Michigan State, and it all matches up, pretty much. <coughs> the problem is, uh, as you're going to see later on, it doesn't mean that we work as a system at the university. <laughs> now, uh, is anybody here from the College of Bay? I thought it was going to be somebody. OK, so I'm from the College of Bay. Thank you very much. OK? And you know what? And you're going to see my example here in a little bit of interdisciplinary research. Is my whole graduate school is based on working across all these colleges. I mean, I was in soil science, and I was in well, I was in art, and I was taking developmental economics and resource economics as my base. But I had it, my professor to make sure you, you're working in a system. And you better understand how all these other people, and, and, and I'm sure it's the same way here in, in the high schools, at least in the old days. But you grew up <coughs> through the experiment station, through the extension services, we learned how to be PhDs, but you learned how to talk to everyone. You learned how to interact across. And I was fortunate, I had a science undergraduate degree in chemistry, so I could talk to tech science and I understood what's going on, and it's helping professionally, and as well as becoming an economist. But, so let's go to health. Or any education. We all have an education school, yet our K-12 don't talk to our higher ed very much. <laughs> and it's a system. We got three medical schools on our campus. We don't have we have a nursing school and they, they're part of the connected to medical schools. And we have some other related health buildings. They're all spread over campus and they don't talk to each other. They don't act as a system. They know it's a they're in a system, but they don't work together. So the students see that as a system. Okay. So the depth part is simple. It's depth, depth, deep in learning, deep in a system. Now, we have to get to the other part. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, this right now because breath requires being able to communicate with other majors. And there's a lot of literature on whether it's interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and everybody argues about it. Bottom line is, 
We can no longer function not being able to talk to key actors in the problems that we want to solve if we don't under, if we don't have a ground in it. This is changing it's how we get elected, folks. Now, my example out of my PhD program, and thank goodness I took uh, my undergraduate experience, I just took everything it's back in the days when you could take everything and didn't have to pay more for it. So. But I went to, uh, after I got my, I went to Thailand this person. I was the only English speaking person in the land reform office in Thailand. We were developing land all over Thailand. It was given, and I had to work, I eventually, I had a team that I had to lead, and the team was made up of a, a crop scientist from Israel working in salt tolerant crops, a water expert from Sweden, and a labor guy from Germany that's sort of the labor economics. Way. And we, I, and then the Thai people that I could speak Thai, and then they were out there, and we had to work together. I had to put it all together. I had to understand what they all meant. Unfortunately, I had enough chemistry to know what that plant scientist was talking about, saving uptake of plants and how to affect crops. I knew enough about, and I, my dad was an engineer, and I had taken some basic engineering that what the, you know, about water flow and where this water was going to come from. And I could understand and talk to them. We could come up with a plan. How many of your graduates today can do that? And at the BA level. So I don't care if you get the arguments of what it is, it's how do we communicate across disciplines and how do we break down the barriers in the university so disciplines can talk to you and students can see it. I'll show you a way a little bit later. Now the other part is, is niches and learning other systems. This will not happen in undergraduate. They don't have enough time to learn one system. But as we develop career wise, we have to provide confidence in, in young people to understand that they as they learn multiple systems. And most of you as professionals in the room probably have already done that. You've mastered the system you started in and then you saw it overlap. And I had to go out and find out information about something and I began to learn how another system. So you have egg and then you have transportation or water is a big one. Anything out here, water and eggs are probably your two mutually exclusive systems right at the moment. But anyway, uh, but you see how it goes. These systems are not independent, they're related. And so it really gets complicated. Now here's the little trick. Once you begin to overlay systems and you begin to put your ability to not only from your deep learning and continue to learn, because that's what deep learning is, and you imagine conversing with other disciplines, you begin to notice the niches that are being created by the overlaps of systems. And you dive into those niches and that's your new, that's your career path. That's how you create your next step in what you're going to do. The top part is really, really messy. The boundary spanning competencies is messy. Everybody has something that they want to dump into this area for no rhyme or reason. They just want to dump it in because they think it's cool and it's their pet thing and they dump it in it. We pulled back and looked at the literature and we decided that this boundary spanning theory, boundary spanning literature, is the best way to find this. This merged in the 1990s. We broke down organization boundaries and organizations, and we began to look at what it needed to do to cross functional boundaries. And there is a very strong literature, and it points to very strong sets of skills, which include project management, teamwork, cultural awareness, perspective, networks, and critical thinking. A lot of the critical thinking that we begin to master in our depth really begins to play out as we move across different functions. Okay? So, that brings us to the meat. Now, Usually, we don't have to worry about the self in a lot of this if we for eyes, because in the eyes, we're more worried about mastering our discipline and diving as deep as we can in it and pushing the boundaries of it. It doesn't worry, it's not worried about who I am, it's how well I can master uh, higher order um, skills needed to push algorithms, theory, and science. You didn't worry about yourself, you were worried about the edges of what the boundaries. But if you're going to be a T, and you're going to cross all these boundaries, you better know about yourself. You're going to have to know a lot about me. So we figured that the me is the glue that binds this T together at the undergraduate level in particular. And so, what happens here? Okay, so we take the me, and we're going to break this down. Now, I'm going to show you what we've done. But this didn't start easy. Um, I have to admit that I sat down. I was trying to figure out how to operationalize a team. So I went to where, where everything is, and how we hear like in, um, in Arizona, like at Michigan State, and all the schools are represented my friends. 
everything's under student success now. I mean, it's it, our mantra is and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but what makes for good student success? And the thing is, um, if you look under the academic success literature, you find out that three things are key: purpose, confidence, and awareness. You look under the professional deal on career stuff and success, and guess what? It's the same three things. So why aren't we speaking the same language? So I took this to my good friend who's and he, you know, he's leaving the university, I'm leaving the university, so I don't know where this will go. But he was an associate, senior associate provost for undergraduate education. He immediately saw, we called in somebody, and she was able to develop this for us. And with this is now the glue that holds the university together. It's all based on purpose. So what we did was we looked at a three core aspects of self-awareness and how they overlap, and we will build this a little bit later, uh, and we're going to show you this, what we're doing. So purpose, this is the key. Purpose is the key. Uh, Purpose-driven education has been around a long time. Uh, usually comes out of religious-based schools that have talked about this for a while. But now it's in the popular literature. If you really want to see purpose-driven life, just look at Oprah on Sunday. Uh, she's doing some of the best stuff. I use her videos with students all the time. She's, she and her people are really, really good about purpose. And Darren, we like to get her on campus and light fire under our students' areas. But purpose is probably now, my personal advice this is a little bit of a um, dreamer, so she gets, but it's where you want to make a difference. Why am I here? Or what really interests me and why would I want to get involved in it? That's figuring out my purpose. <coughs> and she goes on, you know, she's the kind that says, you're born with dreams, and you've got to actualize those, and you've got to figure out what I want to achieve. And unfortunately, in our current environment, you have to do it very early. When I went to college, part of the problem, my, the reason my parents sent me there is figure out what you want to do. You had all four years to do it. Today, we've got it down to about nine months <laughs> because of the pressures. A in graduating four years, the pressure to get a job that makes money. A job. We're not talking about a job here, we're talking about something bigger than that. But that's where the conversation's gotten this, and it's really literally screwing a lot of young people today because they're going to pay for it in their 30s. Okay? Um, I'm preaching now. Um, anyway, <laughs> so this is purpose. Awareness is the ability to be you're aware of yourself, how you relate to others, how your interests relate to others, and how others perceive your interests, how you deal with people that are different and have different perspectives, how people that have different knowledge bases. I hate tell you that the rest of the world doesn't always think the American Revolution was the hottest thing that ever existed in the world. And if you go take the UK and you take history at the same period of time, you can find that the American Revolution was about 10 of the most important things that were going on in the country at the time. We just wanted to get, just beat them in the smithereens or let them go and do what they want. They don't interpret the American Revolution the same way we do. So there's a lot of different knowledge bases the way we do things. And I appreciate that and I understand that. And then to have the confidence to act, the confidence to experiment, the confidence to try things, Knowing how you figure out how you're going to contribute, and together whether I success, I succeed or I fail, I'm willing to continue to lead and grow. Doesn't make simple. I mean, this is basically anybody in this room that's in, in anything that deals with student development as their lifeblood has knows this. I mean, this has been around, but now it becomes the central part of what we do so they can receive both academically and professionally. Now, the most important places on this, and I pulled this out because the next one gets messy. You don't have to copy this down because I should have said this at the beginning. Eileen has the slides. You will be able to have the slide decks. You will not be graded on this, so <laughs> So the most important stuff where the action takes place is in the intersections of the Venn diagram. And so you can see where purpose and awareness, do I understand difference, can I mobilize resources that I need, can I work as a team, can I make plans, can I take plans, can I move towards goals? These are where the action plays place, in the, in the places that aren't overlapping, that's where the you know, development and, and getting the groundwork to be able to act take place. 
Uh, it gets really messy in this diagram. That's why I'm saying you're going to get the slides, so don't worry about it. But this kind of elaborates what goes on in each of these. So what we've done, and I can tell you, I, I'll tell you that this is one of the foundation pieces of Michigan State. And when I talk about how we're implementing things, I'll come back to this. So we went now trying to articulate this to students. So we, I could do a whole bunch of slides leading up to this, but here's basically what happens. There's no place that I can take the big, big pop of tea that I showed you to students and they understand what in the hell I'm talking about, right? Well, some of it, but not all. They actually we do a lot of work with students, and they kind of like the tea. And when we set them about their learning, you should see the, some of the stuff that's come out of some of the learning workshops we've done. And we turn them loose on the tea. Uh, and they just have it's amazing how they think about it and how positive they are about if I can learn as a team. Okay, but well, we have to make this sense to them. So the depth becomes purpose. Because it's the knowledge I need to make a difference or what I'm interested in, and it's where I have to do it that becomes important. Right? So that's the systems piece. And then the awareness piece is, who else do I have to talk to? Where are the other disciplines that I need to begin to work with, understand? What are the challenges I'll face from other issues from different perspective areas that I may not be aware of? And the top part is the confidence. To have the confidence, I have to develop these skills and competencies to cross these boundaries. And so the T to students becomes this. Okay, so that's where we're at, and that's the T, and now we're back to where we started from and have the big T. Now, I hate to tell you this, but, or I hate to tell you, where is this? What it really looks like when they graduate is this. A whole bunch of little T's that are all different shapes, sizes. They are not, and they will never, ever be big T's when they graduate. They just can't. They're only, the traditional ones are only 22 or 23. And the cognitive development hasn't finished, social development hasn't finished. A whole bunch of things have to happen by the time, by between now and the time they're 30. And we want them to be 35, perform like 35 and 40 year olds at the age of 22. It's not going to happen. What's got to happen is we have to have more collaboration with the other side of the street because if we turn them over like this and they don't do anything, these kids die. If they have to nurture on the other side of the street. That's a whole other conversation. Okay, so what are we going to do on campus? What do we have to do? I'm going to talk about three eyes, and just to introduce this, and then we're going to show some examples. And I'm not the only, some of the people that are here uh, from other schools have been involved in the team. They can talk about things they've done. Arizona, you are doing a lot of things yourself. You may not even call them team. So that's the first stop. We have to be intentional. We're doing most of the things on campus whether we know it or not, to produce teams. We're just not intentional about it, and, and I say in a minute, we're not doing a third thing, because we're not integrating these experiences in a way that makes the team understandable to students. So we have to be intentional. We're not inventing a new art here. We're not inventing a new thing. Most of what we need is already here. We do have to be imaginative about how we put things together, we may want to look at new ways to do it. I'll show you some of that, too. We have no choice to use our imagination because we're going to be overwhelmed by what's sitting out there that's coming at us, whether you're on the education side, new, new challenges to way uh, delivery of learning, and on my side, <coughs> the way the career services and the professional side will be developed. But the most important thing, after intentional, is we have to be willing to integrate we cannot go to student engagement. We cannot go to co curricular transcripts and just list things. If they students just get in the list mentality, which they're in, they want to, they'll just go and do everything you tell them to do on your student day, all seven of those things, and thinking that they got all those skills and not know how they relate to anything else that they've done. And we know from the very beginning that this is the most critical step of all. So let me tell you one way to rearrange the university. This is an IBM thing, just to get your thinking. So what IBM has proposed is that we break down the silos of all the departments, and we build this circle, a, a circle with all the major disciplines. So if you see this, it's got 
engineering, and it's got IT, and it's got business and social science and humanities and uh, design and science and math. And then all of the disciplines represented in those big points. In the middle are the 13 systems. Now there's only a few here because there's not enough room, but there's 13 systems. And you can see in systems, in each system there are different colored little circles. Well, what it means is that every this every major color code has to have some faculty working in that system. Okay, so instead of a student coming in and picking a major, then figuring out what they want to do, and then trying to connect to a job, students should come in and take a system where they think that they can make that their interests are, where they want to make a difference, and begin there in sets of four classes. Looking at how faculty from different disciplines interact on the same in the same system, so that they can see where, where they might want to pursue a major. The system becomes more important than uh, the academic major in a way. And I'll tell you why that's going to happen sooner or later anyway. And so what happens is the gray area is the system. So the systems are connected outside the circle to the, because they're real life systems. They're happening every single day of our lives. And so what happens is those scientists and those faculty are already connected outside. You already have alumni that are connected outside. The barrier becomes transparent, uh, transparent and you work back and forth. So the minute the student comes in, they immediately see their connection of that system externally. They begin to see how they can engage it. They begin to do the things that you want. They can learn, they can do job shadows, they can do all kinds of things. I think it'd be, you know, and I can do any colleges adapt this. Yes, the colleges in Finland have gone to this model. They collapse their three national national universities into one. They built, they go to this model. Korea is thinking about doing the same thing. So is Singapore. Actually, Singapore, to do that, first had to build a college of social science and humanities, which they did not have. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, so what are some of the things you can do? First, you have to have a common language. You have to have somebody everybody agrees to. So at Michigan State, we've taken that purpose and built out a purpose platform across the freshman year and across academic advising. And what they do is the minute the student comes for AOP, all they hear, all they think, the first thing they hear is about purpose. In fact, when they apply, they hear about purpose. We have a purpose pillar in the freshman year, and everything is directed about having to help students. Uh, reaffirm, identify, or work towards, uh, certainly by the time they enter their sophomore year, they have a sense of purpose of why they're there. Particularly working with at-risk students, because we know if we give a stronger sense of attachment and why they're there, then we can we have uh, some actual leverage to help them on, on the academic side where they may be struggling. Because if they have doubts on the academic side and they don't have strong interest about where they're going, then, then it's a slippery downward slope. Okay? So having a common language that everybody can agree to, whether you're on the academic side of the fence or on the student affairs side, we have to have a common language that we're all supporting this common goal to where we want students to be. What have things have to happen here is once you have a common language, you have to change the mindsets. The biggest mindset we have to change right now is students. They don't, have, they don't have an opportunity right now, unfortunately, to do what many of us said, have a time to explore. They don't, so they don't have the time to spend as much time um, harming and things. It's getting very costly to do that. The expectations outside the university and what these people can do and how they're going to attach these things is economically high. And so they run a risk of not using their time wisely here. Uh, and it could be a, a problem for them. The big area is space, learning, and technology, and building the T into that. Uh, I've done some work with some insurance companies, and uh, one of them, uh, one, I didn't able to go to this workshop, so I sent somebody else I knew, and it was a big one. It was in the state of Michigan, it was upstate New York. And um, they went and they put on the presentation that we, that we, we said we would, and it went well all morning uh, to take that. Pretty people were there, and everything they wanted to know how they could retain. 
what we told them they had to do some changes. And about halfway, about early afternoon, the senior vice president was in the back room and said, we're not going to do this. This is not our way. We've not been successful. We've always been successful doing it this way. We will continue to do it this way. To this day, they still can't recruit young people to that company. Went to my good buddies, Liberty Mutual in Boston. They faced the same problem a couple weeks later. And we were, I, I made a presentation talking about what we needed to do. And the senior vice president got up and said, look, folks, we got these four granite walls. And it's really expensive granite. But it doesn't mean anything. So we got to make the walls invisible. We got to make this a cool place. And we can't change our product. So we have to have a different mindset about what we do in this space. And for, let them forget the walls exist. And Liberty Mutual is doing quite well, thank you. Uh, and as well as some of the ones in our space, we have national headquarters for four. One of them, Jackson National Life, is one of the biggest in the world because it's high potential here in the UK. And they took over the Barnes and Noble stock. It looks just like Google. They hire 500 internship interns a year. They take a big load of us. They say teach professional development. They teach how to write a resume. They talk about how to interview. But they do all the Google stuff of being inactive in the community. And they took this space, and it's absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And they're, they, don't, they don't even hire these, they, all these kids. But the kids go away with a great experience. So how do you use space becomes critical. And we've worked really hard at this. I'm going to show you a video at the end just to make this flow better. About space from Microsoft and Steelcase. We were a part of the Steelcase lab on, on technology and space and utilization of the JJR group. We're building new corridors. And the problem is, it's great to build buildings, but buildings are obsolete. All these labs, they're all, these rooms are obsolete, and I'm going to show you why. We're building innovation centers, and that's great. Whether you're entrepreneur on innovation innovation centers, or design centers that are open to anybody. So we can get students to come together, work on problems that are important to them, and allow them to experiment and fail, and be there to help them to fail. They've got to learn how to fail. Not in your classroom, but here when they're trying things, because that's what's going to happen when they get out in the real world. So in the Invent Centers, it's not getting all these aha, uh -huh. we got somebody who got this app, we got VC funding. It's all the kids that tried stuff, failed, and, re and got up and tried again. That's what's really important. Another big one for, for Arizona is leadership, because if there's anything that you guys are noted for, it's undergraduate leadership. And it's really, really important. But leadership is really, really the key here out of all the team. Because we go out and talk to a lot of employers. We've had our employer partners come in. And they'll look at that. We don't call that team. But what we really see is our leadership coming out of team kind of people. And boy, if you can help us develop those team people earlier, we'll be very grateful. But really the mantra is, and this came from Dow Agroscience, one of our big employers down from Indiana. Uh, anyway, they say, and this is common across the we need people that can lead from every seat. It's not the people that make the truck. We need leaders in every seat. So, unfortunately, <coughs> this is one I mucked up in. Uh, the president signed me. She said, I don't care about the 39 things that are going on campus on leadership that only get to the top 20% of students. What we have to do, have to do, and I've not done this, and this is, i got nine months to get this sorted out. Um, you, we, I want every student that's in the 80%, you know, the, from the 79th percentile down to the 21st percentile to be able to lead and be confident that they can lead when they lead. Every Spartan needs to lead. Why is it the bottom 20%? Well, that's not because she doesn't want it, but they're gonna, they're working so hard to get these kids through school that we throw anything more on their plate. Uh, and, and believe it or not. The street smarts that these kids are already make them leaders. They don't need what the middle parts never tried any of the stuff that they had to do. They already failed enough. They already picked up these skills. They have to be engaged. And I know you're engaged in the year is really important. They have to be engaged in many different ways. There's a lot of ways to be engaged. And there's some in the hierarchy things that are more important than others. They eventually have to have some pre-professional experience that allows them to transition 
successfully. You can't get through it now without kind of engagement that prepares you by having you had an experience on the other side of the street. You just can't make it. But all the other experiences and all the other possible engagements are the foundation piece for that, that big one. Because everything we do is integrated. I will point out that one of the common responses I get when I travel across is, we'll just put in a class. That will solve it. That's family mindset, let's put in a class. And we'll just get all freshmen to take the class, all sophomores, all seniors will take the No. It doesn't work. And then they take this class and something I have to check off. It has to be like our mindset embedded in everything we do. So whether it's being spark ready at the University of Tampa or spark ready at Michigan State or cap ready here, that means that they have to know that everything they do is preparing them to transition successfully whatever they want to do. And so it's a mindset change. Capstone, unfortunately, except in engineering, is kind of organized different. I'm way too late. Okay? And I said, integrating is the key. We've done a lot of work on this, initially starting with problems in, in study abroad. We built unpacking the study abroad experience and integrating it. And now we're, we're trying to leverage that, except some of the key people have left for health reasons. And so we're kind of scrambling how we're going to put that back together. Now these are just examples. We've got classes going on. We've got uh, faculty and others trying all different kinds of things. Michigan State is a bubble up kind of environment. It's not a top down. So I can't tell you how much is going on. And I know that the deans that say, oh, the team's not working in campus, feel the wrath of the president. Because she only says it once and she expects everybody to just remember it. And sometimes they forget. But it's bubbling up. In a lot of places, in some places it's not. But you would you do talk to the dean of engineering at our school, and he said we're doing that already. We're still not. But you talk to their career people, and they know exactly what they're doing, and they're pushing these kids as hard as they can with ETs. And the, you know, the dean doesn't even know. Business school is a whole different thing. They know everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, here's where this gets really, really up and nasty and hard, is assessing this, and we have to assess it. Now, the AAC and U came out with all their skills and they gave rubrics on how to successfully do this. They're fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I would have come up with the same reason if I hadn't shifted from skills and competencies to a whole new profession. And what we're going to look at is I'm going to show you the Boise State stuff as, as a study we did, uh, and just and a lot of people have seen this, but to reinforce this. These skills and competencies come in bundles, they're integrated together, they work with each other, and, and, to, and to do an assessment of each one individually doesn't work, because we try to overlay them. Uh, I have a colleague that's been working on this, uh, and he, next to me, and spent years, last year and a half, trying to overlay all these skills and company rubrics to get something that's common. It, it's, it doesn't work that way. It's really hard. We're going to have to come up with creative ways to assess whether it's storytelling, whether it's other ways to uh, find out ways to articulate uh, how students are developing their teens. And just to point out, this is the book Boise study. And what happened was, I used a very different kind of statistical method that's used, that the skills and competencies usually don't use. They use the scales. I've done this all my life. The Viper scales, 1 to 5, 1 to 7, 1 to 10, whatever. And what happens is, over the years, because we know what's important, you know, when I first did it back in 1993 or 4, nobody knew, you know, so I get spread out along my scale. But now we've done it so much, everything's a 5, or a 7, or a 10. And that's what happened to AAC and U. Well, the problem with Likert scales is they, we tend to have a bias towards each, the high or the low ends, but in this case, the high ends. And it doesn't tell you how they relate to each other, and which is really important. So we use contingent evaluation now that the computers have gotten really sophisticated. And with employers, and what that does is ask, uh, in this case, it was asked to be successful in their first position, what is up? new hire in your company you have to be able to do, 
and he presents them with four of the skills and says which is the most important, which is the least important. And then you go through those iterations until they're all being compared with each other. And then it, rank, it does rank them from highest to lowest, but, and then and give you the order. And then you get to see if, 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 if there's, depends on how far they're separated from each other. You may have one that's two times higher than the next one, well that one's two times more important than everything else. So it tells you the difference between them. What's amazing about the standard deviation of these, these all overlapped. So while the order in the blue bundle is the one from the top to the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or whatever there, that's their order, one K. The standard deviation says they all come in the bundle. As, well, it's the second bundle, which was there was a significant gap between those. And you can see it involves things that will come from the depth part and things that come from the breadth part. You need both parts, and they have to be integrated. And the students have to see them work. You can't just tell a student, you need communication skills. And we're going to evaluate you. No, because it goes into how you communicate data, how you acquire knowledge, how you manage things. It's, it's multifaceted. Okay. Now I'm going to jump and talk about something that's coming your way. Tim, this has moved so fast into October. Uh, I can't believe I'm on these spots, but anyway. So what's going to change this is coming up with assessments that can begin to measure this stuff. And what we do know now is that uh, companies have long wanted organizational fit measures. Everybody wear organizational fit, kind of what that is. And, and it came up in 1982, and it's been around, and it's very difficult to work with. I cut my teeth working on board on this, and it takes hours and hours of tests, retests, building uh, on paper pencil exercises so you can capture culture, you can capture the way that things are done, and it becomes very uh, cultural bound, it becomes very subjective, and they're very hard uh, to deal with, even though as computers, technologies advance, we've got people that say they can do it. Well, now there's a whole new world uh, about organizational fit. And it's all coming out of neuro and cognitive abilities and the ability to map the mind and how it, how it does the, these kind of skills and competencies <coughs> together. So NAG is a group out of Stanford and MIT. I knew that these people were coming out. I had worked with some of their uh, graduate students, actually. Um, and so they knew, knew this was coming. I didn't realize it was coming back where it was. They were a couple, about 18 months ago, they were having some problems with some of their algorithms. It seemed to have gotten past that. But these are big people from Stanford and MIT, as you would expect. Um, and so what they've done is they've developed an organizational fit assessment that we've been, our IO science people and myself have evaluated as an assessment. It's much better than anything else out there. Okay, I'm going to give you the preview, the bad news. For, we don't often, we don't know yet what it, what it tells us it's going to do. Now, some of that information is coming out. We're going to get our first report on a company that's used it for a year as a, um, as a developmental tool. Of people in the organization, so it gets their after their one year performance review. But we still don't know a lot about developmental yet. You would believe that these people would have thought of this, and so that's why I got involved because they came down and asked if I. Based on my teamwork, if I do some developmental stuff, we're just getting into this. This thing is going much faster now. So what it's based on is gaming. It's just playing some very simple games that take eight to ten minutes. Drill sessions, thirty minutes. By the time you get feedback, it's forty minutes. Uh, and what happens here is the student plays, the candidate plays these games, and it, it, it begin, and it's underneath it is built. All these kinds of skills, competencies, and then they build on that into what I would call the value-driven leadership stuff. Okay. Uh, for example, the top one is a waiter. You're a waiter, uh, and you have to serve all these people. And it starts very simply. You take the orders, but then you have to start delivering food in a certain way. And they watch your strategy, and how you use the resources around you, and you change your strategy when it gets really fast. And some people give up and stop. And other people change their strategies. I've got a couple people playing this in my staff, and they're addicted to this. <laughs> uh, they like this, and the kids like it. Uh, anyway, so there's three games. So what happens here is it's built on, of course, their NAC, so they're going to game everything their way. 
So NADs are basically about 36 different skills and competencies that we come right off my list. Um, okay? And they are color coded. So under social intelligence, the big group is emotional intelligence, and it has four little blue separate things that I don't have to memorize. I can't tell you all of them. Then they have power NADs. And the power NADs are the really super things that drive employers. Uh, and they're the ones that are made up of multiple combinations of NADs. They know this pretty well, they've got this pretty well down. So the biggest one when you talk to our employers is grit or resilience. As an academic, we like to use resilience. It's sounds like it just use the word grit. We got a big sign coming from Grand Rapids East Lansing is some quote by John Wayne is just all about grit. <laughs> and that's what employers want. And he actually students respond to it. Resilience, you know, that sounds like some academic made that up in his room smoking his pipe or whatever. Uh, anyway, the supernax are a huge number of occupational clusters that they map on the NACs and the power NACs. So it makes it easy for employers to vote campaigns. They could pull it out of this, or they can then, this is where the company makes money, is so that employers can come and ask for specialized NACs for their particular positions. So what happens is, the company then builds a campaign or an opportunity around their position. So auto owners insurance would build four. They build actuarial, they build IT and computer services, they would build a business, general business services, and sales. Business marketing sales. And so they have four. And so what happens is that they pull in uh, that campaign and then they pull in the, their based on their profile, the NACs and the super NACs that they want. And as you add more and more, it tells how many games to play. The most that they have to pay for all three games is $14.50. Now folks, this is not the end all of end alls. This doesn't mean the resume has gone away. This is how they build their talent pools. Then all the face-to-face -face stuff comes later. Okay? But, if I'm building my talent pool, and I can give 100 people at students uh, 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 at a fun night, have them just have fun taking the nap, <coughs> which these students will do, and I walk away with 100, that's costing less than $1,500. can't even attend my career fair for half of that. I mean, that's, anyway, so the price point is very low here, and it does undermine. Okay, on the other side, the students can take this right now, and they want Michigan State students on it very bad. They won't allow it on there until we know more how to use it because they haven't provided information on how to interpret this. And if it's going to be developmental in our world, I better know how this is going to work out. Okay? Of course, they're from Stanford and MIT. Why should we worry about the big things? It's developmental and how to interpret this for students. They should just be blessed by giving this information. Anyway, <laughs> students have a couple options. They can just take it blank and not pick uh, some kind of career that they want. Or this young woman picked investment banking, and based on her on an X scores, they placed her at 81. That probably would not get her into an investment banking. It's probably too low. Uh, but then she gets profiles of her key, her key counter NACs and her key uh, uh, NACs. Okay. So how does this work? And how will this work? How do they envision it working? Well, they have got companies coming up. Let me point out why companies will go to this first. Companies have a very expensive proposition when it comes to talent development and talent acquisition. There's three realms of it. There's new college, new hires, which usually we're going to say come from college and universities. Then there's uh, experienced hires, and then there's training and development. Up until this point, there has been no software that covers all three of those. And experienced hire is the most costly, so they spend a lot of money on this. And most of us think that there's deep pockets on the new hire side. No, they're the bottom of the barrel of most organizations, to tell you the truth. This software can be used for all three things, and that's how they're marketing it. And these companies are gravitating this quickly. So it's not <coughs> just uh, uh, for one thing. And the companies I talk to, I'm you know, I'm not even getting paid, but I on my talks when they hear about this, they want to know about it. So in the Midwest, we thought manufacturers, GPs, gone to this. 
uh, IBM, Cisco, Intel. They're just in a far game. Wait until I talk to you about the accounting firms. Okay. So what happens here is that the putting your camp, I have an employer, I put in my campaign, and all these students just don't load up to their NAC site. It becomes the labor market now. All the students there. And what happens is uh, there'd be so much in there that nobody can actually search very well. So this computer does it for you based on your profiles. So I'm an employer, I've got my campaign in there, and I get 150 names from students that have profiles that match what I want, my profile. So I've now got a talent pool. On the other hand, I'm, uh, you know, can, um, Carol uh, might, uh, might be here as a student, and she's sitting out with her profile in, and she may get notification, here's six different job opportunities that you may not be aware of that are just suited for your, you know, um, um, for you, that you may not know. They don't have to search because the fit measures will search for them. Then it's then, then it's the students that job to introduce themselves to the company. That's when the resume comes in. That's when all the stuff that we do come in. Uh, and, the, and the employer does the same thing. Now, they're advertising this as school blind, gender blind, race blind, grade blind, etc. And it is. I'm not sitting by and around the table with these MIT and Stanford people that where is it going to go blind to Stanford and MIT? I don't know why I'm But having said that, I was an accounting faculty, I would be shivering in my boots of what's going on at the high end. Deloitte, college blind. Ernst and Young, major blind. PW, major blind. Ernst and Young, and I know PW, are using NAC as a subsidiary to their own uh, organizational fit profile. The reason and why would those companies do that? Well, they're already in the UK and Canada. There are no undergraduate accounting programs in the UK or Canada. They don't have them. So they already have to select this way. And it's been very, very successful. And Black from EY got up a month ago in front of SOAS and said, Going major wine, and et cetera, and we're going to go school wine too. And because our whole profession is changing, they aren't going to tell you about the AI software that's going to come in that's going to wipe out most of those traditional accounting jobs. They need a different kind of person. And this assessment will fit that. But there's other companies doing the same thing. And that's going to change the landscape quite a bit. Okay, so let me get out of here. So, why is the T important? Well, you've got to have a T, uh, and again, I've already talked about the challenges for some students, but most of our students have to have the T um, anchored in the T to survive what's coming. Because one, we have an oversupply, global oversupply of college labor. It's just, we can't, we have to face up the fact we're putting an odd lot of college uh, grads out there with not enough college qualified grads. We've got a lot of underemployment going on and things because we just, you know, we're, when you go in the labor market, you push them back down the streets to take jobs that didn't require jobs. And it's been going on for a long time. This is nothing new. You understand the dynamics. We keep pushing a lot of kids. There's a lot more opportunities in the apprentice trades, in the vocational trades, in the two year schools. And maybe we should start more kids there. It's going to hurt our pocketbooks in the four year schools, maybe with the desertion of the state. Uh, but uh, it makes more sense. But the real thing I want to talk about, and I've talked about this before, is the job destruction that's going to come, and being able to be adapting and innovative and move into those niches in the team. And they're coming, and they're coming very fast. And they're coming through two ways, cognitive software. <laughs> IBM just announced, uh, using the Internet of Things, that they're going to be totally disruptive in a number of occupations trying to rearrange so there's more efficiency and it's going to create more great jobs for a few people and the masses will have to find their way. Uh, and robotics will do it. Robotics might come a little later, but they're certainly there. How many of you work in pharmacy? Anybody in pharmacy? Do we have pharmacy here? Well, I'd be scared to death if I was in pharmacy because Billbox is a robotic system that's being put in in all the big hospitals. It won't affect CVS and Walgreens. 
it's, they're too small yet. They have to scale up way, way down. But you go to most hospitals, there's probably only one or two true pharmacists on duty in some of these hospitals because Toolbox is a robot that can do it all. And it's already connected to all the medical records and can tell, oh, and they want to walk. You can't, you cannot uh, award that. Is my time running out? No. Okay. You, um, you can't uh, do that because the medical records, so this person's already on another drug, but, and the pharmacists may not know that as well as connected as they are. Okay. So I go back to, to David Mendel from MIT, our robots ourselves, and he does actual robots in very scary places. So he puts them way down in that in the trench, um, you know, that goes around the world. It's really, really deep, and no humans can go to. And he puts them in volcanoes, and he works with drones, with you know, uh, that have taken over the Air Force and things like that. And he says, and this is one of the things that you have to understand: you change the technology. <coughs> change the task. And to change the task, you change the nature of the worker you have to have. And in fact, you change the entire population of people working in the system. This is T, folks. <coughs> and for example, we've got a US, an Air Force made up of fighter pilots that are excellent. And they have a mission. And we got a drone force with the same mission. The problem is, fighter pilots are not good drone pilots. And good drone pilots are good fighter pilots. Because the system is changing. It's the same thing. We have to have kid, young people, any of us, you and I have to be able to adapt. Okay. So, uh, I will not go on that. Okay, so I just want to scare all the liver congeners out of all the people that are here from career services. <laughs> and anybody, and mainly career services, because just as an example of how far this is going to go, the model of career services is built on in the 1950s. <laughs> career services is 60 years old today in Michigan State. Uh, most of us were founded right after. A few were built as Facebook bureaus. Dale was the first one. Um, and but most of us came out of World War II when and Illinois was about the same time, um, yeah, same time, and uh, came out of World War II when the federal government passed over the placement bureaus for benefits to colleges and universities and set up placement services. Okay, and we set it up, and guess what? We set it up as thirty three thousand now today individual operations where we each have our own labor market and we protect our students. They're our students. They can't be out there. We have to control them and we have to, you know, if you're a nasty evil employer, you can't come on board and, you know, I'm not going to share my information with anybody else. And now the Internet of Things looks down that and says, this is totally inefficient. They've done it to taxi cabs with no one foreseen it's going to get worse for them. And they're looking down at us and saying, whoa, this is totally inefficient. This is not a labor market. This is okay. Look at all the resources that no one are used. If we can just rearrange them, and they can do this with the Internet of Things, we're going to create a whole new system, and that's exactly what's coming. First step is handshake. It's one step closer. And next, another step closer. And I know what's being worked on out there. It's a scary thing. You guys have got to change. Because 10 years ago, this model is not going to work. We have a, so, it's new technology. It changed the task. It changes the kind of people. And it tells us we have to work the system differently. And I, we've been spending all morning with AW how we're going to change, how we're going to rework ourselves in this system. It changes a whole bunch of things. Okay? Let's see what I mean. So, this is my favorite quote, not my most, I mean, J.R. told me, I mean, one of the rents is my favorite book, so, seven books, um, it's written for one book, so, it's a book. Um, but, Susan's book quickly follows, so we love the being here, but they, they can't stay, I hope they can find food, I hope they may. That's generally our motto, we graduate or we got a degree, I hope they succeed. Uh, no longer can we do that, folks. Today's world, we're going to be responsible for way down the road. We are going to be we're going to be accountable for way down the road, and so we have to look at this a little bit different. Okay, what I'm going to do is now just don't go there yet. I'm going to show you this. We're working on learning the space, so this is kind of go back 
and they show you a video. And this is a video put out by Microsoft in Steelcase. Now we work with Microsoft in Steelcase through Steelcase's um, learning lab, and we work with JJR something or other, who is an architect design work completely looking at removing how we're going to create new learning environments and learning corridors at Michigan State by eliminating walls, basically, and rearranging where learning takes place. And as I said when I kicked off that thing, you've got to make the walls invisible. You've got to reach out and pull it in. When I team taught for years, I would teach the first five weeks and the other person would teach the next five weeks. And then the students got out of it. Later on, I developed it. We made it in the classroom. We had a joint project. But now you're going to be the that we're going to be in the same room together. They're going to be working with teams of students across disciplines on problems from day one, and they're going to be able to connect out to what's really going on. They're going to be able to bring alumni in. What this video does, and then on the career side, how does it change how we interact with students? Why do we need offices? They don't even need a desk. Okay? And what this does is, this is a video I can show it forwards or backwards. Doesn't make any difference. First time I saw this, I thought, this doesn't make any sense. This was just a bunch of different ways to use technology. When you start looking at it all one story, you can take the, cake, the little kids you see in a classroom and make them big adult kids. You can your imagination go that this is all one experience going on over a period of time simultaneously. It has a beginning and if I showed it backwards, you would end up in the same place. So be careful what you watch. Watch this. There's going to be some close things that I'll point out and see if you've caught. <coughs> but watch the technology. Tell me where the offices are. <coughs> Tell me where the labs are. Okay? So roll it.
So she's a, what's my next project? She's on her next project. Every one of those probably on an armband. You're, what, here's what you're on your team, and that's that's what they talk about back to future teams. I'm getting word back and concern about engineering. We're getting a lot of young engineers getting their first job, and then all of a sudden they have to bid on 1099 as a 1099. It's like they don't even know what the heck's happening. To them. But this is the way the world is going. The way the technology you don't need rooms. You don't. So what does that mean for me and career services? When I have this big campus, why do I need an office? I can walk around and, of course, we have to have somebody with oh, ice technology like this for us. Because it's here. This is not Jules Byrne 50 years. This is technology that they're using right now. And so how do I build an interface? So I can walk down this mall and stop at one of these kiosks and talk to a student and have a student like that. And I can immediately go to a company and have a law come out and talk to them. And I can have an advisor section and have a NAT come up on there. I don't need an office. I need to be out there engaged with students in a completely different way. But I got so many walked in that if I had that advice, I have to be in a room with four walls now. And a door with you can't see through. No, it's not going to happen. And the same thing with all of us. We're dependent on things that are becoming quickly obsolete. And so this is what's coming, and this is how it changes our mindset and how we work, and what we have to get students in, because they're going to work in environments like this. It's already here. So that's all I want, and here for both the conversation, we get you talking about how you're going to be more intentional, how you're going to integrate this stuff, because you're already doing it. And how can you use the things you got, because our resources are limited, in a more imaginative ways to create experiences that will position students better to transition to the long term, not just to get a job. So that's all I have to say. Oh, you're still here, so I can take questions. Uh, I promise I won't necessarily answer them. No, I won't answer them, yes. <coughs> Oh, I talked about that. I, I mean, they haven't talked about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying there's no, no possibility now you can use this. A company can choose to use this. So they can come and say, we want all students that want to come to us and that we'd like them to take the nap. And that they could, oh, I think, what you're talking about was that they only wanted to see the Well, here's the deal. You know, you've all been to Disney World or Disneyland on this side. <laughs> And you've done the fast pass. Well, the nap becomes the fast pass. It's just like the movie that Rex Lewis trying to do. Right. And but this is more detailed information than Rex Lewis had. And if you want to see me, you get in the long line. And if you have to sit there for an hour before you see somebody and you can't see a bunch of other people, so be it. Not that we don't want you, it's just that you know if you're gonna stand in line for 30 minutes or an hour, why don't you take the nap and get an hour one? Because you're like, it's gonna do it on your phone. And this is what it is. So I was creating scenarios for you to think at different ways that companies can use this. There's a lot of different ways. Say you come to an information lab. They get 150 kids there and say, where's the point to take this thing? And here's and then after they do it, here's why we use it. And here's and you're going to get your scores. And, and if you don't necessarily match up with us, you know, you're going to have you might match better with somebody else. Okay, instead of going through this and the kid applying and never hearing and stuff like this. Okay, on the career side, it doesn't take away the face to face. Eventually, they have to do the face to face. It doesn't take away the resume and all that. It just repositions what when that stuff becomes important. Yes. So, yeah, I know I can expect your sorry. You know, you, Arizona is dangerous. You can have me come. It's Tony Wood and our stuff and answer your questions. You should let me go. No, no. Come on. Please. All right, so we're talking about organizational fit and some instrument that could potentially assess the degree of fit. To what extent uh, is the ideal profile, and I say that generously, permeates the entire organization? Okay, so here's, here's the deal. Based on neuroscience and stuff, it's very objective. 
Everybody's doing it the same way. It's measuring the same thing. So you have to have a standard profile on the employer side. And that's where all the face-to-face -face stuff comes in. Now you've got to do your, you've got a pool, and it's just like any pool, but you've now defined it there for what certain way. Now you've got to be able to evaluate it. So now the test is, if you use this, and you hire out of that pool, how well do they perform? If they don't perform any better than the way you've always done it, then why use it? But if they do perform a lot better, then you go back. I mean, you're right. We don't, there's not enough information out there. We know, what we do know, is the assessment is better than any other organization out there. But like other organizations, we don't know how it relates to job performance, how we relate to development, and how does it relate to selection and whatever. We don't know yet. But the problem is, on the employer side, is it's going so fast because they've been looking for something like this that it's overwhelming our ability to straighten this out and what it means for students. Because we'll have students doing this and you won't even know it. Yes, in the back, yes. In the NAC model, you put a lot of emphasis on major planning. <coughs> yep. And uh, quite a lot of campuses place emphasis on majors, right. including U of A. Yes. So what do you predict uh, on the organizational re uh, reformation of the yeah. campuses? Well, in many good places, the whole, you know, if you see the literature on the employer side and the talent side, major have gone away quickly on that side, except for some things. They need engineers to be trained as engineers. They need nurses to train as nurses. Geez, do those marketing people all have to come from marketing people? No, heavens forbid. They mostly don't. So the thing is, there's a lot of companies that don't have to have okay, a lot of specialty skills that will can do way. But look at if they know what their engineer has to look like five years from now, and they want to have that developed, and they don't have and, and they want to do it, they can just take their engineers to take the nap. They're in major specific, but they'll take the hire a different kind of engineer than they're hiring right now. So there are a lot of multiple things that are going to go on here in something like this. Now, you're going way too deep with the NAC to see where it's going. I just pointed this out as one of several tools, but this, I, what I want to warn you is, it's coming very fast. These technologies are coming very fast. For the pace that universities change at, for the pace that universities adjust, we're going to get blindsided because they're just going to Companies don't wait around for us to make decisions. And so I want to just say, don't pour in. There's a lot of deep questions you ask. I probably can't even answer. This is just to say, look, this is really going big on the employer side. They're going to start using it. You're going to start seeing it. And you're going to have to answer questions. So be aware. Yes? Let's take that as an example. How did they really Oh, that's a good question. Well, some people don't have gaming skills. Okay, so we know we know it has a lot to do with the culture and what happens with how those kids are engaged. We also know that those skills exist with low-income kids that come from poor high schools, as they may come out the same as kids from high school. It's just they can't succeed because they haven't been in an environment. So there's a lot of environmental conditions that come into play. There's developmental things. How do we stimulate these? It only indicates that your mental processes are tuned to these kind of skills. You better develop them and show me how you do them. It doesn't say that you can do them. It says this is the way you think. So they pull them into their talent pool and then show me. Yeah. I was just going to say, That's how, we, that's how we're going to make money. We're going to charge the companies to get all these things. Yeah. Oh, and now we're getting to this society. The folks just don't spend, there's more here. The more important stuff is not the NAC. So I hope we don't dwell on this all the whole time. That was. Okay. Uh, I have a question for a key professional. Yeah. I work in a unit in graduate college. Yeah. I did some student services. Um, I 
guess you could say that graduate students come in as little T's to their graduate education, whether it's masters or PhDs. Yeah, yeah but we're so that's changing too. Uh, and that's a big conflict between the students that are coming in and realizing to do what they want to do, they have to be more T and faculty are very high. Um, I'm gonna pun, I'm not gonna pun on this because I want you to go to our graduate school careers service and professional development folks. We have a special unit for that, and they are heavy in the team and how they train graduate students to be teams. And I'll let you have Matt Helms on that because they're working on that and he's way out in front, so he, and I don't even know where he's at right now. I have to talk to him. He doesn't have an office, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they have a brand new graduate school. Obviously, he probably, you know. Oh, we're having a big argument on campus. I'm taking away offices, and people get all that sooner than that. Where's somebody back here? Okay, way in the back over there. One of the challenges that we have here, particularly around early career preparation, is when you're thinking about sending out messaging during. Orientation, it was first, that first semester of like classes. Yeah. There's that sense that they're already transitioning into college that's already in that. So we're not necessarily, we have challenges with setting the message early right. about those developmental milestones right. that need to be put in. So, what have you done at Michigan State to kind of address but that? The issue? thing that, you know, most students in their first experience with college coming in, whether it's A or B in the summer and then into the early years, really don't have time for career stuff. I mean, they want to figure out where they live who they're going to go out with, where the party is, and then where my classes are, and you know, do I have enough money to to buy the books, or can I wait for the fifth week to buy books? <laughs> uh, and, and they want to, and that's really important stuff. So it's 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 really hard to put a career message in there. But what we've done is we've gone to a common language. So everybody in AOP talks about purpose. All the academic advisors talk about purpose. All the first year school and our interdisciplinary courses and our writing course, our writing courses are writing course, our learning outcomes, which are 12 essentials, which is a document about the 12 professional competencies. And in the, in the interdisciplinary schools are coming to be our systems courses. So they're hearing it from multiple voices. So we put them in, so when they hear residence halls, now they're a little bit behind. Uh, they kind of got a lot of resources, so they put them real high walls let anybody in. But everybody's supposed to be talking about the same language. And so it comes in, you know, so even if the student doesn't know they're doing career stuff, we're talking about purpose, being engaged, how you how you develop confidence, are you aware of the resources? And what's happened over the last two years is the number of students seeking appointments in the first two years has skyrocketed. They talk to us. Uh, we're trying to figure out multiple ways that money's disappeared to support that. So I'm going to talk to all those of what she's going to do about that. We are now also in the process of a deliberately cross-training everybody on campus uh, about basic career education and transitional career education. I mean, many of my colleagues have been putting and trying to put the same position uh, and stuff. We're not trying to do that. We're just trying to make it uh, kind of a holistic kind of advising experience, that there's no reason that an advising appointment advisor can't talk about basic career. And we have a triage kind of thing that if they, they fail the triage, they really need to get to a career person, which happens to be right in the same office. So uh, we spread people around, kind of like you do. Uh, but it has to be this common language. Where we are, we going to be successful at it, I don't know. It takes forever for Michigan State to change. And there's pockets of resistance. Everywhere. 